It is my great pleasure to introduce you the first uh, session and moderate it. And we have our very first uh, speaker with us. And um, he actually took basically uh, the, the text that I had prepared to introduce Wolfgang Becker already away because I cannot even match uh, the passion that Holly has described uh, for this person. Um, Wolfgang Becker, uh, founder and CEO of uh, Becker & Hickel, uh, a uh, pioneer actually in the commercialization of time correlated single phone accounting for now over 25 years, author of uh, several books, numerous papers um, of uh, film applications and TCSPC in general, both spectroscopy and imaging in life sciences and material sciences. Um, and we're very happy to have uh, Wolfgang with us here today. Uh, Wolfgang, without further ado, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thanks, and Holly, thank you very much for this beautiful introduction and praising my work for TCSPC. I'm really flattered and I'm happy and really happy to also to give this, uh, this presentation here. And I thank you very much for doing all this organization job. So I'm perfectly aware how difficult this is. We have our own, our own, we have organized a few small events here. And I know that struggling with hop in or zoom is really something different than struggling with objective, objective lenses and aberrations and diffractions or anything like that. So this, it's difficult. So thank you very much for organizing this. And thanks also to the attendees for joining our little conference and especially this presentation. So my, the title of my presentation is The Multidimensional World, World of TCSPC Flim. The plan is that I will tell you a few things, what fluorescence, fluorescence decay curves are telling us, what is TCSPC Flim, how do TCSPC Flim data look like, I will also uh, say a few word, words about the fact that TCSPC FLIM, and this is actually the message of this talk, TCSPC FLIM is intrinsically multidimensional, and it is so already on the level of the decay curves. But more than that, TCSPC FLIM is also able to record very complex photon distributions. So in to make a long story short, in modern TCSPC FLIM is able to record several parameters of a biological system simultaneously. So let's make use, make use of this and let's see how we can do this. So this is a fluorescence decay curve. At least actually needless to, to explain to you what a fluorescence decay curve is. Of course, the fluorescence decay time is different for different fluorophores. And because it is so, the microscopy people usually say, hey, great, this is, this is great. I can use the fluorescence lifetime to distinguish different fluorophores. So that's certainly true, but it's by far not all. And actually, considering the fluorescence lifetime just as a, as a contrast parameter in microscopy is means that you are missing the point of flim. Because the really interesting thing is that a fluorophore has different lifetime in different molecular environment. So the fluor in, in other words, the fluorescence lifetime is an indicator of the molecular environment. So you can use it to determine parameters, biochemical parameters of a biological system. So normally the fluorescence decay, a fluorescence decay function is single exponential. It is single exponential as long as you have only one fluorophore. And as, as long as it is, as it is in, a, in a homogeneous environment, but in biologi biological systems, of course, the molecular environment is not homogeneous and you, you get a multi-exponential decay. And the interesting thing is actually that if, you, if you're able to disentangle the individual components of this multi-exponential decay is the individual amplitudes and lifetimes, these parameters describe independent parameters of the biological system. So in other words, we have to record the entire decay curve, not just determine something like a fluorescence lifetime. We need the entire curve to do this multi-parameter analysis. And by doing so, we immediately finding ourselves in a multidimensional world because we have determined several parameters of a system. And this is the multidimensional world of TCSPC flim. 
So, how are we recording Flynn? I have shown this slide hundreds of times already. So we have a laser scanning microscope. We use pulsed excitation at high repetition rate. The laser scanning microscope is scanning the sample with this pulsed laser beam. The fluorescence light goes to a detector and the detector is able to deliver an electrical pulse for every detected photon. What they are doing, doing then is we determine the time of this photon in the laser pulse sequence, or I can also say it's the time in the fluorescence decay function. We determine the position of the laser beam in the moment of the photon detection, and we use this to build up a photon distribution over X, Y, and T, and this is our flim result. So, why does this work? There's always concern of many people that what happens if we don't if we have several photons in one laser pulse period? So we can time only one photon here. If we have more, we are losing them, and the result gets wrong. And this is maybe not understandable to many people. Many people even can't understand. They they think that every laser pulse must excite a full fluorescence decay functions with hundreds and hundreds of photons. So if we time only one photons of these, the result must be necessarily wrong or something must be wrong with the whole technique or we must, <coughs> we must artificially reduce the light intensity to get only one photon. So this is all confusing to, to many people. So this is, uh, the, the, there's a lot of, of misconception about TCSPC, and it's very hard to get rid of these things. It's a, a little bit similar than all uh, than uh, like a conspiration theory. So the truth is, our light intensities, which we can get from biological samples, are so low that we detect no more than about one photon for 100 laser pulses. So no problem with multi-photon detection. We don't have only one photon, so the result is that this thing is working. And as we have only one photon per pulse, the recording goes like this. We can record everything slowly and accurately. A photon here and a photon there and more photons and a photon at this time and a photon at that time until we have filled our whole data array with photons. So we have an excellent sensitivity because all photons are used to build up the result. We get a wonderful image because the scanning process suppresses out of focus signals and scattering. And we have recorded the full time resolution. We have, uh, the, the, we have recorded the, the full decay curve and we have done so even with a beautiful time resolution because our fast detectors deliver an IRF width of less than 20 picoseconds. So this looks good. How are our data looking like? This is a photon distribution recorded by TCSPC FLIM. It may look ugly, but what you see here, all these individual peaks represent a fluorescence decay in one of the pixels of the image. And it's now the task of our data analysis to convert this into a beautiful lifetime image. You have it here. So this is still an image just of something like the average fluorescence lifetime, but you see the fluorescence decay curves are mighty exponential. So you can extract from this images of the lifetimes of the decay components and amplitudes of the decay components. So that's, this is the real information which is behind these data. Let me come straight to a couple of examples. This is FRET. In FRET experiments, especially if you use FRET for finding out something about protein interaction, you normally have a, an interacting donor fraction and you have a non-interacting donor fraction. The interacting one gives you a fast decay. The non-interacting gives you a slow decay. If you analyze this by double exponential decay analysis, you simultaneously get the classic FRET efficiency, the FRET efficiency of the interacting donor, you get the amount of interacting donor. This is the ratio of A and B. And you even get an, an, a measure of the distance of donor and acceptor. So this is independent biological information, just 
extracted from the multi-exponential parameters of the decay curves, it is application of the multidimensional world of TCSPC. Another nice application is imaging, autofluorescence imaging of small organisms. You see this here, this is a small shrimp. This is the lifetime. This is the fast decay component. This is the slow decay component. And this is the ratio of the two amplitudes. Here's something. Even 20 years after the introduction of TCSPC film, you still have surprises. So what we did is we recorded image, uh, film images of mushroom spores. And what we found were extremely fast decay components. In this case, with an average T1 fast component of 17 picoseconds. And it's not only there, it's the dominating decay component. You find the same thing in human hair, you find it in human nevi, you find, find it in hair of cats and dogs, and you even find a fast decay component in a solution of FAD. So this is interesting, and uh, it shows that there's still a couple of things which, are, uh, we, which need for uh, wait for discovery and further investigation. So now, the, actually, the hottest application which we have now is NADH flim of cells and tissues. So bound and unbound NADH have different lifetimes. You get a lifetime image for the free NADH, you get a lifetime image for the bound NADH, and you get a concentration ratio of both. And the concentration ratio is extremely important because this gives us a measure of the type of the metabolic of the metabolism the cells are running. In normal tissue, you have oxidative phosphorylation, and in this case, you have a relatively high amount of bound NADH. If the cell is running glycosylysis, as cancer cells are doing, you have a high amount of unbound NADH. You can distinguish this by decay analysis and get an information whether you have cancer or not. So we, this is a test under clinic, uh, clinical conditions. We went to a hospital. They had patients which were diagnosed with bladder cancer. The patients were obtained the surgery. The excised material went to a flim system. We had just had two minutes to put a flim image from each of, the, each of these dishes, and then it went ahead to histology. The question was now, can we use the amplitude ratio of bound and unbound NADH for diagnosis of cancer? And here's the result. These are seven patients. They were a classic endoscopy, initial endoscopy said, this is suspicious, this is suspicious, tumor, 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 tumor. We did flim on this and we said, hey, stop, folks. This is not correct. This is healthy tissue. This is also healthy tissue. This looks a bit suspicious. This is healthy. This is healthy. You see it from the distribution of the amplitude of the fast component. For this, we found a few suspicious cells here and here, and this is clearly tumor. So and now the surprise was, after a week, we had the histology results. They said healthy, healthy, inflammation, 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 low-grade tumor, high-grade tumor. So a perfect confirmation of the flim results by histology. What do you want more? And this is actually, it was already the first part of my presentation. So this is TCSPC, it's the simplest implementation of TCSPC flim, and it can do a lot of things. And it could do link, uh, things where, where maybe some biologists even have not dreamed about yet, but it can do more because you can add additional dimensions to the photon distribution itself. We always call this wizard flim because it's uh, it's not understandable to Maras. You must be a wizard or witch to understand this. So, what can we do? The simplest example is multi wavelength flim. We have a detector, and for every photon, the detector doesn't only deliver a an output pulse for timing, it also delivers a signal which tells us the wavelength of the photon. And all we have to do is we build up a photon distribution which includes this wavelength. And the result 
is a data array which has 16 images for different wavelengths, and these are lifetime images recorded all simultaneously. Okay, another example. Recording dynamic effects by FLIM. You probably know that FLIM and especially TCSPC FLIM has the reputation of needing extremely long acquisition times. You see immediately here, this is not correct. This is a time series of moving bacteria and it, these are 0.4 second snapshots taken every one second. You see how this cell here is moving here. Oh, sorry. It, I, I got lost. So here, this is moving. This is a moving amoeba, same thing. So the problem is this, the acquisition time here was 0.4 seconds. Can we do faster? The problem is if we are going faster, we get less photons per recording and less photons means that we probably don't have enough photons to get a meaningful lifetime from this. So can we compensate for lower photon number, for instance, by higher excitation power? If we try this, we induce photo bleaching and photo damage in our sample. You see these colored spots here and here, they look nice, but they're actually spots where the sample got burned. And if you continue recording in this case, these spots are becoming bigger and bigger and finally eat up the whole image. So can we record fast changes without the need of high excitation power? That's the question. Good. Our TCSPC devices have a mode which is called temporal mosaic flim. It's just recording a fast sequence of small images and puts everyone in one big data set. So the obvious advantage is we don't need readout and save times between the recording, between these individual recordings. So it's a bit faster, but it's not super fast. Question, can we do better? The idea is actually this, we can consider this to be just one single big photon distribution. And if it is a photon distribution, we, in principle, we can stimulate a dynamic effect in the sample periodically and accumulate res the result. A photon distribution can be accumulated. So, okay, let's apply this for calcium imaging. These are 64 images from of live neurons, they are cultured in a little cell dish and they are electrically stimulated. We incubated the, the, the sample with Oregon green butter to get an information about the calcium concentration. So what we are doing is we say scan, 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 stimulate, scan, 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 scan. Next cycle, scan, 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 stimulate, scan, 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 and so on and so on. And after 100 stimulation cycles, we have this data array and we see very nicely that with the stimulation, the calcium concentration goes up and then it goes down, 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 down to the resting concentration. So it works and it works with surprisingly high time resolution. The scan time per mosaic element here is 38 milliseconds. So the, a technique which is normally considered to, very, to be very slow, resolves calcium transients with a resolution of 38 milliseconds. And it does so without the need of extremely high count rates, without the need of extremely high excitation power. That means it's friendly to live cells. So good, fast effects, dynamic effects, imaged by TCSPC flim. Just by using the idea that the TCSPC flim result is a photon distribution. You may say, okay, Wolfgang, that's fine, but I have dynamic effects which I can't trigger or stimulate. They just happen and I want to record this. How can you do this? Well, this is the lack of a water flea, a live water flea. It's autofluorescence and these are 0.5 second scans 
from a larger time series. So you see within 0.5 seconds, this is autofluorescence, we don't get too many photons, so this is noisy and our lifetime uh, information is not accurate enough for us to, to get a, a reasonable lifetime information, in this case even a, a reasonable metabolic information from this water flea. So what can we do? We remember we need a big photon distribution, so we load the entire the entire time series into our SPC image data analysis. So we have 64 images of the water flea leg here. The, water, the, the leg is moving. You see most of these images. It's, sorry, they always switch it by itself. The, the leg is moving, so most of the images are badly distorted. So it doesn't look very nice, but we see that there is a lifetime information in that. So what can we do further? We load these data into the phaser plot. So we have a phaser representation of this entire photon distribution. We select a phaser range here, which corresponds to the lifetime signature of the, of the leg. In the next step, we back annotate this phaser range in the time domain images. We sum up the photons in the select of the selected pixels. And all of a sudden, we have a wonderful fluorescence decay curve, which contains 5 million and almost 700,000 photons. It can be analyzed with extremely high precision. Here, this is triple exponential data analysis. And just in case if uh, someone of the uh, metabolic flint people are watching us, you will probably say, okay, these components here, this looks like FAD with a small, uh, uh, small, with a small contribution of FMN. And this is certainly correct. So this is the amazing thing. TCSPC flim with the right data analysis is able to do metabolic flim on the moving leg of a live water flea. This is great. So there is a lot of more things which we can do, but we don't have all time of the world. So I should come actually to the end. So if you're interested to learn a bit more about the other things, just take a look into our TCSPC handbook. I'm thanking the people in my company who have made is possible. I'm also thanking the users of our technique. This is just a somewhat arbitrary selection. Actually, I, I should mention almost 100 or more than 100 people here. This is impossible. So if I forgot you, please don't get angry. I'm also th thanking these science organization for giving funding to us and our users. And finally, I'm thanking you for watching this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Um, as usual, a very insightful introduction talk into TCSPC and FLIM. Um, we do have a few questions from the audience, which I would like to relay. Um, first of all, um, Xu Zhang um, was actually uh, asking the following question. I was told by my facility manager that if the Tau one um, he got was only a fraction of one nanosecond, so less than one nanosecond, it's likely an artifact. Is that true, question mark? Um, so could you comment on that, Wolfgang? No, of course, it, it, I have to take a look at the data to say whether something is an artifact, but if T1, T1 is smaller than the nanoseconds are, are very common in autofluorescence, for instance, NADH, FAD, T1 is on the order of 300 to 400, 500 picoseconds, and I showed you the mushroom spores who had a T1 of 17 picoseconds. Such short lifetimes do exist, and there is even biological meaning in it. So I, my advice is if you find something which is that short, just follow it up, find out what it is. Maybe something interesting. Thank you. One more question from Marcella Royas Piers. Um, can you please provide an example of an application of the wizard flip that you are referring to in your presentation? 
What is a wizard flim application in your opinion? Yes, it, well, what we, it, wizard flim is uh, for us is a just a name for techniques which contain which record more complex photon distributions. Here in this case, it was either multi-wave length flim or it, or it was flim of moving objects, uh, flim of dynamic effects. So in, in case of dynamic effects, it's a photon distribution over X and Y the time of the photons in the fluorescence decay and the total observation time, the macroscopic time in seconds or something like that. So this is a complex, uh, a complex photon distribution and we call it wizard flim because it's hard to understand for muggles. I hope we don't have muggles in the audit, uh, auditory. I think we are all wizards. So, and one of the applications is actually, which I showed there, is actually calcium imaging by TCSPC flim. So we are determining the calcium concentration via the fluorescence lifetime. So this is, it works very well. And it, it has the advantage that we don't have, that we get quantitative, quantitative measures of the, of the calcium concentration independent of the possibly changing concentration of the, of the calcium dye. So this is just one application. There are more. There are some multi-wavelength applications. The problem of multi-wavelength imaging is that to do it right, you need a, a, a model which contains not only the decay times, but also the spectral behavior of the sample. And this is hard and difficult and mathematically not entirely solved yet. But basically, it's possible it should be done. If you're interested to do this, <laughs> we would be happy to help. All right, Wolfgang, thank you very much.